Is investment something that's always been on your mind, but you don't quite know how to get started on that journey? We are here to set you on the right course. Welcome to My Cashflow Academy's Investor's Corner with your host, Athena Paquette Cornier. We are all about getting out of the rat race through creating positive passive income through real estate investing. Here you'll hear from regular people just like you and the professionals who support us towards greater wealth. Learn before you earn, move from analysis to action, and find the right path to attaining the success that you've always dreamed of for yourself. Now, here's your host, Athena. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. We have a few people that joined us, so welcome, everyone. Um, so we'll get started. So uh, okay. welcome uh, to uh, Investor's Corner. And my name is Athena Paquette Cormier, and I'm your host. Investor's Corner is where we uh, invite people who have gotten out of the rat race through investing in whatever their investment uh, vehicle is. Mostly we do real estate, but it can be any investment. And they come on our show to kind of share their experience, the steps they went through to gain that uh, to get out of that rat race. And the second thing we do is we invite uh, the companies and affiliates and um, industry experts who help us grow our wealth. So uh, we've had Sean and Debbie Zanker on before. They are uh, insurance experts, and I've been uh, lucky enough to know them for more than 20 years, I think now, or something yeah. like 20 yeah. years, which yeah. is astounding. Yeah. I guess mm -hmm. I shouldn't have said that, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they have helped me a lot. Um, un unsolicited, they're always trying to find us a better deal, better coverage. And so um, I know no better experts than them to explain to us today, kind of not only as investors, but even as homeowners, do what is condo insurance that goes inside our unit and what is the condo insurance that the HOA or the association uh, has to buy for the entire building or complex or community? What's the difference? And um, kind of what are, what, what are we covered for and what are we not and what should we look out for? So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you guys and, and maybe just start with what condo insurance is. Okay. Uh, basically, condo insurance is for the unit owner, essentially, that covers your personal belongings. And uh, uh, depending on the type of HOA policy that you might have, uh, you would have coverage for your uh, inside wall coverage, as well as uh, liability protection. And in a nutshell, that's kind of what it is. Um, so if I'm a condo owner, um, as a lender, we require people mm -hmm. to get uh, what we call HO6, right? And I think that's just the code yes. for the type of yes. insurance it is or something like that, right? Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm required to require people to get insurance to cover like the inside. So yeah. typically we think of it almost like renter's insurance. Like, yeah, if there's a... Um, if a pipe breaks and water's gushing all over the place, I would want to be able to... Maybe my computer got ruined since we're all working from home. Maybe my flooring is ruined because I was away for an entire week and, and the water settled in. I mean, it could just be someone broke in. Like, what, what, what does my inside insurance cover me for from? Well, it actually gets started from and dictated first and foremost by the, um, the homeowners association Oh. Um, the, actually, the, the bylaws, um, it will say in there if it's walls in um, or if it covers everything at all. All in, I believe, is the correct term that they use. Um, so that's what you have to look at first and foremost. And then from there is the big what I call the big policy, the policy is. of the entire community. The, you check it, that the master first. policy gets consulted. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and so then once you, you know what that covers, then you go and find what you need for your own unit. Yes. That is okay. correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if someone buys a condo, are you guys... Uh, checking that master insurance, Paul, we send that to you for you to see? We, or we do. Work? We actually kind of go behind the scenes and we will look a lot of the, um, that information is available online now more often than not. So we can get a lot of that information. Um, but most of the time we try to offer just as a general nature, just a very comprehensive coverage 
that are, that will cover just about every case scenario. We'll look at photos of the interior of the condominium, um, and we'll really kind of look at to see if there's just standard or if anything's been upgraded. Um, and we kind of go by that as a gauge. And of course, feedback, if we have questions, maybe what we're looking at online is not very current and maybe you've done some upgrades. So, you yeah. know, all, all those things do come up at some point and then we periodically do uh, checking even after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, I think the other uh, thing is, is uh, when you get the all-in policy um, where it does cover uh, the drywall and the cabinets and that kind of thing, is to put it back to original condition. So if you had tile on your countertops, that's what they're going to put, put in there right. uh, originally. Mm-hmm. But if you had upgraded it to granite or something like that, you're going to get tile. So right. that's why you want to make sure that you um, have your own HO6 policy with betterments coverage or inside wall or whatever you want to call that mm. uh, to cover that. And then you've got um, the HOA deductible to deal with too. Um, a lot of times they're very, very high. And uh, if you haven't sustained enough uh, damage to that, um, they may not, may not even come into play to repair. Uh, so let's, for example, you have a $25,000 HOA deductible and there's just damage to your unit, mm-hmm. right? Well, you got $25,000 worth of damage. How are you going to get that covered? If you have your own HO6 policy, it's going to cover that. Once it gets to that $25,000, then it's really up the, uh, the insurance company to possibly go after the HOA policy and have them pay the difference, you know, once it gets past that deductible. Mm. Um, and by oh, the way, it is... It is covered um, under the policy under your loss assessment uh, will pay for that deductible. Yeah. So, so you say know, that some, again, who's paying for the deductible? Well, if you have an HO6 policy as part of the policy, um, everyone should have loss assessment coverage on their policy. Um, and what that will typically do is pay for a deductible if the HOA's policy has the $25,000 deductible um, and you as the unit uh, owner are responsible for paying that, um, that's where it gets paid from if you have that loss assessment coverage. Mm. Okay, so another question that comes up for for buyers who are looking to buy a condo, whether it's an investment or not, um, is like special assessments. So my understanding is there's one of these policies, I don't know which one, covers you in case out of the blue, the HOA decides, you know what, we need to repaint this entire complex. I can think of a building down by the beach. They have special assessments every five years, those poor people. So um, so let's say they want to paint the entire building. Each owner's assessed X amount of yeah. dollars. So is there one of these insurances that covers you for that or helps you with that? Yeah, they should in that instance, always submit it into their condo policy, claim it if they're assessed um, and seek coverage. There is some allotment for that. That's been actually in the news a lot lately. Mm. And, and I'm, I'm getting the feeling that some insurance companies are covering it and others are not covering it. Mm-hmm. So there seems to be certain circumstances there that are involved as to whether they cover that sort of thing or not. So you but would we, be able to we recommend policy? always turn it in. Yeah. Always well, turn it yeah, in. A few years ago, a personal friend of mine uh, owned a unit down, um, down the hill from me here and they had a huge special assessment and these people had lived in this building since it was built in 1985. So fast forward, 2005, 2006, the the prices are high, you know, this is right before the crash. And they decide that this whole building is too woodsy looking. They need to, you know, redo it. So they assessed everyone $75,000. Now keep in mind, a lot of these retirees had paid 150 for their condo. Yeah. So yeah. It's, um, even though there's inflation and time passed, but it's still a shock, right? To Sure to it is. This. And 
there are several of those people in that unit that could have tried to put a claim in, I think, and they never, they didn't even know about this, right? right. They just sold their condo figuring, oh, well, I yeah. can't afford this. The, and the HOA for, um, you know, offered a payment schedule, but you know, yeah. if your original mortgage payment's 400, now your special assessment is six or 700 a month. I mean, right. You know, yeah. for a retiree, there's just no way. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there's been some instances here where that kind of thing has happened and um, the unit owner, owners actually band together, um, got an attorney uh, to fight that. Uh, many of them claimed, you know, we're retired, we're on fixed income, uh, you know, whatever their case may be. We don't we can't qualify for a loan to take equity out of the home. Right. That's out of the unit. Right. To Yeah. So. Yeah, it, it's, it complicates it. It definitely mm-hmm. com- complicates it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and then insurance companies have caps too in the dollar amount of loss assessment coverage that's offered. So in a certain so building or a certain state or a certain- um, it's, it's more uh, company and package specific. So the type of policy you have will have different limits that are available. So every company could be different in that area. So for example, if, Mm -hmm. if, you know, they come forward and they're going to assess you say a hundred thousand, but maybe as much as you can get on your policy coverage is 50 or 75. I mean, well, obviously there's, there's going to be a deficit there that, that needs still needs to be paid. So what do you do there? So, you know, and, and some of these, um, you know, I think people in general, unit owners, they they expect some of this, or at least they should yeah. when they buy into a condominium, um, right. and they should know expect that this would happen from time to time. Potentially, right? It right. Could happen. Right. Look at the building. Yeah. Is the building, uh, you know, updated? Is it newer? Is it older? Because at some point, you know, on down the line, it could it could happen mm-hmm. if you have management that doesn't stay on top of the housekeeping and the you know, and there's risk potential there. Mm -hmm. If the policy is not in force on the HOA, nobody's monitoring that. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's just a slew of things that can go wrong there. And it really exposes the individual unit owners. Um, You know, they're all at risk. You're all in it together, right? Yeah. That's what I tell people who want to buy a condo. You're buying into a business. When you buy a condo, you are, you know, you're, you're becoming part of a company and each owner is together as company owners. And you're going to elect whoever's going to be in charge of this business being your board of directors. So that's right. You know, and if you open your mouth too much, you'll become on the board of directors, which, <laughs> yeah. you know, you yeah. know, one of these is like, you know, that is true. And, and anyone who wants to be, you know, president of the board, please yeah. step forward and everyone steps back. And, you know, right. yeah. I, 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 well, you know <laughs> it is a huge responsibility. It's a huge undertaking. And you are the person that gets looked at if something goes wrong. You right. Know, that, and you're crazy. usually a volunteer. It's a volunteer mm-hmm. job. Yeah, not a everybody thousand dollar job. Yeah, but all the unit owners need to go to the meetings. You know, I, I know that common nature of people, you know, they do a lot of complaining and, you know, this isn't right and this isn't right. But, you know, go to the meetings, participate, voice your yeah. frustration or you see something, a trip and fall ha- hazard, maybe in the common areas. Speak up. Yeah. You know, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because you're all you're all in it and you're all invested in it and you need to keep mm-hmm. the place safe, keep it clean, you know, make rec- recommendations. And, you know, that's part of you doing your part. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So. So um, how is the so how is H.O. six and like renters insurance different? Like what would someone who's renting a condo maybe do differently they're just a renter. They're not the owner. Right. So they're not so, right. so is that the main difference or what, what, what's really the difference between those? You want to take that one, Sean? Yeah. Basically a renter is just going to ensure their personal belonging stuff that they physically carried into the unit as opposed to unit owners ensuring, you know, cabinets, walls, you know, the lighting, all that stuff. That's kind of really the main difference there. Okay. Yeah, so just from a renter perspective, 
place catches on fire and they can't live there, <clears throat> well, the unit owner's policy isn't going to pay for them to live somewhere else while it's being rebuilt, right? Mm-hmm. So their renter's policy is also going to extend coverage to pay for other living, uh, you know, mm-hmm. arrangements until the uh, till they can move back in. Okay, so that that's a good point there. So as investors, I yes. feel like you should always have rent loss insurance, right? You, you like should you always a have property. Is that what you call it? Rent loss insurance. It's right. um, you just I lost my rent. <laughs> yeah, no. In your um, well, I, you know that's good. That's a good it, way to put it. it. That I is, it. yeah. Um, <clears throat> every rental agreement or lease agreement should include a clause in there that requires any tenant to get their own renter's insurance. I mean, it's it's a clause that's standard in many leases and rental agreements. Now we're mm-hmm. seeing it more and more. Uh, not in all of them, but more often than not. And it's also an opportunity that the owner is giving legal notice to the tenant. Look, I, my policy or anything that I have isn't going to cover you and your possessions mm-hmm. if something happens here. So, you know, it, it puts the burden. Yes, it's more money for the tenant. It's a little extra expense that they have to have. Mm. Um, but certainly worth it. And they will certainly see the value and realize that value if, if a loss ever happens, because mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous mm-hmm. inconvenience being put out of your home and um, relocating is however many months it's going to take. Um, yeah, to rehab the unit to be livable again. Yeah. 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 So Especially now it, with contractors, few and far between. I mean, yeah. Building business is just, you know, tradesmen are just super busy right now. So it's sure they are longer to even do little jobs, actually longer right. because they don't want the little jobs. Right. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so what is this thing? Uh, rent loss insurance when a, when a landlord has, when a uh, investor has in their policy that if something happens to the unit, they, they can pay to have the person live elsewhere. What is that called? Well, that, that pretty much is on uh, the unit owner. So as a, uh, as, as an investor, you get the HO6 and you make sure that it has a uh, loss of rents coverage on it. Okay. Uh, yeah. And is that super expensive or not? Or I mean, what does it, no, it not really. The rent amount? Not really. I mean, in, you know, in the big picture, it's not um, typically a, uh, I don't know. It's hard to throw a number out there as to what a cost for a policy is, but I, I'm going to say it's five five hundred dollars a year. I, I would say that's a probably a pretty good yeah, yeah on for, average for Cal- California yeah yeah for, uh, unit owner yeah for a landlord's type condo policy condo yeah okay. So another um, kind of topic that's been coming up is with the short term rentals. Um, um, I've gotten notice from the city cathedral city uh, is going to phase out and ban uh, a lot of the desert cities are starting to tighten or ban altogether the short term rentals. Yeah. So I also got a notice from them and they're in their big long list of things that I got to do to be eligible to use my unit, how I want to use it. They uh, say you have to have now commercial insurance for your unit. What do they mean by that? Is that more than just condo insurance? Is it more than uh, landlord insurance? Is it, what do they mean by that? There's, um, <clears throat> we have a company that um, it is a commercial company. It's actually a policy written through Lloyd's of London uh, and it's on commercial paper. Um, I'm not sure how to explain the difference, but basically there's a personal lines paper, which would be like a typical homeowner's policy. Mm. And then there's commercial poly- uh, paper where it would be like on an apartment building, yeah. you know, more than five units. Right. Okay. So, it's, yeah. more, it's more defining that you are as a short-term rental. It's a business. Yeah. Mm. We do have one yeah. of those companies. Um, we just have a handful of policies through it because it's so expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think the, the city's trying to make everything expensive. So, yeah. decide, so you voluntarily decide to not do it, right? I mean, yeah, I, exactly. and that's what I'm yeah. trying to measure. Do I even want to do this anymore? Right. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know. But yeah, uh, yeah. So, so I think right now, 
a regular insurance policy for for my my unit's like 1200 square feet and i'm just using this as an example to kind of frame it for people uh dollar wise so i think that's like 600 700 a year and then when i did short term rental you guys we had to upgrade it's it it's almost now. doubled yeah, yeah, it went it to 1300 a year instead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now that it's going to go commercial, is it going to be more like 2000 a year? Or? I don't think it'd be that much. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's going to yeah, be a it's just a, It's a few hundred dollars more, yeah. Okay. But just going short-term rentals is, you know, fairly expensive because yeah. it's higher there's risk. so many people it's coming risk. in. You don't yeah. know who is in there. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. And then... Um, and if someone is there a difference in the insurance cost if you're if you're renting six months versus a year like yeah short term versus long, long term is there, is there something where your companies like it better if people there long term or yeah yeah the long term absolutely short term you know you could get someone in there that's short term they really don't care about the property they could destroy it very quickly mm. you know a, a big thing here is a, a lot of these properties are being rented for short term and they have these big parties and they just destroy the places yeah. and they feel that if you've got a longer term tenant the um potential the risk potential is a lot less yeah. um mm. you know I, you always question a renter anyway. That's why you want to do your homework and, you know, right. know who you're renting to, um, to avoid that. But no insurance companies, definitely if they're going to accept long-term versus short-term rent rentals, um, they want the long, the long-term renter. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so some other questions that came in more on the, not so much investor side, but kind of, um, so if there's a theft in the unit, yep. that would be our HO6 that covers that, right? If someone steals something, somehow breaks into the condo and steals something. Yeah. So if you have it, an HO6. Well, it depends on what's stolen. Mm. If, it's, if it's the tenant's personal belongings, mm. that's not your concern. That's their problem. Mm-hmm. Right under they the should renters. have a renter's policy to cover that. Right. So right. It breaks in and. I don't know, steals your light fixtures or your washer and dryer that you put in. And yes. Yeah. Um, then okay. Your, your and then if it's up. not a renter, but our own unit, our own. Um, your own yeah. unit. If, that's if, your yeah. own policy that covers yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You should have personal property coverage enough to cover anything that you physically carry into your unit. Furniture, yeah. clothing, electronics. Yeah you know, all that stuff. If you mm-hmm. have an, a, an abundance of jewelry or enough jewelry, you should schedule that. You should mm-hmm. make sure, because those policies only cover up to a certain amount. Mm-hmm. So if you have, yeah, say... You have heirlooms or diamonds or... Yeah, you, you want to make sure you adequately insure all of that. And then if someone, because some people have safes in their home, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have a safe and you have coins, cash, whatever in there, how do you prove that you... Like if someone breaks in, I've had people, even Tom's uncle, you know, the whole entire safe was stolen yeah. out of the yeah. property, right? So yeah. how do you, how do you, what do you, what do we do when we have to place a claim? How do we prove we had 10 coins worth a million dollars? Well, first of all, uh, the, like she was saying, there's uh, what's called a sublimit on the policy for, for certain items. For example, the typical number for coins is $500. So yeah. if, if you haven't told the insurance company that you have all these other things, that's all they're going to pay. Now, as far as that $500 improving it, um, typically they're going to take your word for it. Um, especially if you can show them there's the hole in the wall where the safe was. And yeah. I had, you know, my jewelry and all these other things in there. Yeah. And uh, of, of course they're going to want to see that there's been some, Entry, force of entry. Yeah. You know, if, if you have some receipts, that's great. Yeah. Um, again, uh, they kind of take your word for it on some of the stuff. Right. Uh, they prefer, though, that you have it documented. It, it, it's, it only ensures the outcome of that claim is going to be sure. better. If you have paperwork, receipts, 
uh, purchases for things, even photographs. Photos. We have yeah. we have clients that photograph their stuff, serial numbers on TVs and electronics. You and, just yeah. take a we'll picture of the serial phone. number. Yeah, you can and just yeah. store it. You could you could do that. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So what else should we be documenting? I mean, it sounds like they're taking our word for it, but really, what if someone has more? We'll take jewelry, for example. What if someone has more jewelry than the limit? Then they have to disclose with like a list or how do you? Well, it, it, they're only going to pay up to that sublimit. So if you've got, you know, $100,000 worth of jewelry and you take a picture, here it is. They're going to say, well, your policy only covers, you know, $1,500. Here's right. your check for $1,500. Right. So you, you, sh- need to- you should have told us you had all that so we could schedule it and make sure it's covered. Right. Okay. Yeah. So how, how does that work to get them to cover or paintings, you know, people have collectibles of baseball yeah. cards, whatever. How it depends do you... on the value. Uh, okay. Sometimes we're going to need an appraisal. Uh, and generally it has to be, you know, within two years, um, that appraisal will give you, you know, 23 months old and they'll still take that. Mm. So it just depends on what the item is that you're talking about uh, and the value of it. So um, generally if you have a piece of jewelry that's over like 10000 it's probably a good idea to schedule that. Um, and get an appraisal on it. That way we can insure it properly. And Yeah, so it wouldn't be lumped in with your personal property coverage. It would be separate. It would be separately listed. It would be clearly defined on your yeah. policy what it is, that piece of jewelry, um, and its value. Yeah, and not only yeah. that, when you schedule it, uh, the coverage changes a little bit. So, for example, um, you have a party, and uh, you've got a $20,000 Rolex that's – just missing, right? There's no forced uh, entry anywhere. You just happen to notice it's gone. Mm. Um, with a scheduled piece like that, they're going to cover that. Uh, another one would be uh, like a ring that has several diamonds in it. Mm. If it loses a diamond, uh, mm. there's going to be coverage for that. Mm-hmm. Mm. As opposed to just saying, okay, here's my $1,500 worth of coverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, those things aren't going to be covered. So mm-hmm. if you schedule it, uh, the coverage is broader. Right. Mm. So this may sound weird, but what about like intellectual property kind of stuff? Let's say you've got recordings. I mean, artists have stuff. Is there a way to cover that kind of stuff or, uh, you know what I mean? Like the drawings, the. There, there has to be some way to put a value on it. Yeah. And then once we the have same the thing, value, kind of yes. an appraisal kind of. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure what they do. I know that we had several insureds that had that same situation. We had um, collections of stuff. And and when it came down to it, it was defined. I mean, a lot of that stuff is only of value to the owner of those things. Right. You know, right. Mm -hmm. So. I I can't remember off the top of my head what we did, but I think we had to determine a value and we had to submit that into the insurance company, Mm -hmm. a very descriptive about it. And then they came back with an offering that, okay, we will, you know, put those things as part of the policy and charge applicable premium for that. That was a Mm -hmm. collection. It was a doll collection. Yeah, when you're thinking that it was a doll. Was it? I remember there was. And they weren't. They weren't like antique dolls or anything like that. It was just, just. I, I remember there were also some yeah. like uh, geodes. Okay. There was geodes. There was comic, an extensive comic book collection. Yeah. Uh, guns falls yeah. under the same thing. Yeah. Um, I'm sure a lot of those. Yeah. So uh, these are areas where if people have. People have uh, their own perceived value in them, but it's not yes. a marketplace value, we'll call it, right? Right. So right. they should somehow determine the value of that yeah. on paper some, with an expert to help them down the road, right? I think, I think yeah. every, every, it depends on what it is, but a lot of times the insurance companies want the client to be open about it and to set their own value. Um, the insurance company might investigate on the outside and take that information and, you know, in order to place even a premium on it. Mm. Um, So, yeah. But if if you have something unusual like that, it can't be assumed it's going to always be covered under the personal property coverage 
you know, if you've got any kind of collectibles or something of great value, art falls under that same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you want to make sure that that all of that is going to be replaced. And and probably a good thing, a rule of thumb to do is walk through every single room of your house mm-hmm. and kind of take an inventory. If there was a fire and everything got destroyed, you know, what what kind of value would you expect to get out of these, you know, different items that you have? Mm. Take video, store that video somewhere, um, you know, take notes of serial numbers, pictures mm. of certain electronics, cameras, musical instruments, musical instruments yeah. you know, those kinds of things. And because mm. uh, you want to make sure that you do get as much out of your policy during a time of loss. And that's really the true way to make sure that you have the best outcome mm-hmm. is to document it. You're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Right. And we even have clients that do that, that send us the documents so that we keep them here mm-hmm. uh, in their file in case something happens later on. And then, oh. gosh, we had one client that, that did that. He had collectibles and he would buy and sell constantly. And oh. <laughs> we, we were documenting, updating, you know, storing. I mean, it was just, but that's part of, part of the deal. And, oh, so you know, cool. he says, well, if all this stuff is kept in my house, he said, that defeats the purpose, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. So he said, can, you know, mm-hmm. you guys keep it on file and that's exactly what we did. So. Yeah. Dang, you must have some kind of filing system. And well, we do. Room. We absolutely do. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Yeah, so crazy. if something, um, so if something gets stolen out of the garage, so we talked about inside the unit. So your yep. HF6 as a homeowner, not a renter, but as a homeowner, anything you say you took in to the unit is covered. So now what if it's, you know, um, in the garage or it's on your front porch or yeah, like I think of the, the what it, porch bandits or whatever they call it, you know, people are stealing stuff yeah. off porches now. So, yeah. so who would cover that? Cause I imagine the, the HOA probably doesn't want the little no. stuff, right? No, your, your policy would cover that, uh, but you got to uh, take into consideration. You have a deductible that you have to, to meet. And then uh, there's always the, the rate increase once you do turn a claim in. So you got to mm-hmm. figure out what was the value of that item versus your deductible and what's the increase rate's going to be for three years. Is it even worth turning it in? Yeah. But since you mentioned uh, like a garage thing, mm-hmm. um, there's a whole uh, uh, another insurance arm that has come into play in the last couple of years, and it's for electric bikes. You would assume that a bike would be covered under your uh, personal property, but it's not. Electric bikes have their own separate policy, just like a motorcycle would have. Oh, wow. Yeah, and those are crazy. getting really popular. They are. COVID. Oh, my God. The, yeah. the lady that sells the, is it Pedego or something like that? There's a store down on PCH. They're super busy. Crazy yeah. busy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're very expensive and they, uh, you know, you want to protect them, that, that's for sure. And yeah. unfortunately, they're being stolen. So that's one of those yeah. things you don't want to make assumptions and say, yeah, it's included in my personal oh, property. Oh, that's a good, good yeah. tip. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we move on to the master insurance policy? So we know okay. kind of that our insert, we, that's our HO6, that's good. So the master insurance policy, what does it cover for us as individuals, if anything, and then I, my understanding is it covers mostly the, the, so the, the entirety of the association as a group, as a company, right? It, it is, it is. It covers the building, the outside building, um, outside walls, um, covers all of the common areas for liability. You know, the unit owners are going to be, um, having people over, they're going to, get to that unit. They might trip and fall along the way. So there's all those common areas that are covered by that. Um, it covers the directors and officers uh, for, you know, their wrongdoing. Um, so basically it, it you could kind of look at it is it's the same coverage like on a condo unit owner's policy. It's just mm-hmm. of a broader form in nature because they're covering more. Mm. So you still have your liability. You still have your building portion that gets covered. 
Um, mm-hmm. You still have personal property in there. So it, it, it's, it's, it's all the same. It's just on a much larger scale. Mm-hmm. So then when there is a loss, they first figure out, okay, whose policy comes at play here? Is it, did the loss happen in a common area where the HOA would policy master policy cover, mm-hmm. or is it in the unit owners, you know, was it their territory? So it's, a lot of these policies work in conjunction with one another. Sometimes they overlap in, in you know, in coverage, which is okay. I mean, it, it, get, it gets worked out. Mm. Um, you mean the insurance yeah, the, companies figure it out amongst themselves? When, when, there is, when there is a loss, whenever there is a question of who's negligent, mm. all, everybody gets put into the mix for review. The master association policy gets consulted the unit owner's policy gets consulted. Um, it, that's just how it works. They review very detailed the policy language, uh, determine the cause of loss, um, and then the, the appropriate insurance company will settle that loss based on that review and final investigation. Right. So they have liability insurance in case someone gets hurt yep. anywhere on the property, the pool, the patio, the whatever. Right. Okay. Yep. And it seems to have maybe a clubhouse. Amenities. Yeah, clubhouse, good one. <laughs> so, yeah. so the more amenities a building has, the the more expensive and more coverage they're probably going to get. Right. So yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and then the officers and directors. So if someone volunteers to be on the HOA board, does mm-hmm. that mean that the HOA's insurance covers them in case, or not covers them, covers the HOA in case that director? does something wrong. Yeah. If they steal money or yeah. Yeah. If they have that coverage. Yeah. Yeah, If they have that coverage, most of the time they do. I can't imagine any agent offering an HOA policy without that. That's like a key thing, but, but it's an add on, but it is, it really is. It is. Yeah. So can I, can I go back a little bit um, back to the, like the unit owner and, uh, and the, uh, the investor. Yeah. Um, Personal injury coverage is really important. Um, in two ways. So I'll I'll cover the first one as a unit owner, right? So you've got your liability coverage. There's another box to tick and it's called personal injury coverage. It's for libel and slander. So um, uh, I haven't seen it in our agency, but I read about it where um, maybe you get your teenager or get online social media and, you know, just start posting stuff and slander somebody. Um, as long as you have that coverage, uh, personal injury coverage, you've, you've got some protection there. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah. now, yeah. So now as a, you um, mean to say people get sued because their teenager was slandering people online. Yeah. It's there. <laughs> yeah. Or you go on and you, and you do a review on a, uh, a restaurant and uh-huh. you put a bad review in there, uh, thinking that you're, you know, legitimately putting this bad review on there when maybe you didn't quite get the whole story as to what happened in your situation. You know what I mean? Mm. So, yeah. And then the other one is as a, um, uh, as an investor owning that, that unit and you're renting it out, you also want to make sure you have that for wrongful entry as well as libel and slander uh, to protect you in case, you know, you go into the unit without notifying your, your tenant or uh, somehow you slander them. Uh, so those things are really important and they're really yeah. cheap too. It's like, $25 for the year to have that on. Right. So you, oh, wow. It's not, yeah. And it's not something that's um, in the package. It's a box you got to check to yeah. make sure you have. Yeah. It's important to check the right, check the right boxes, right? Yeah. yeah. Who, who knew? I would never have thought of that. Yeah. So does yeah. that cover you in case your property management does something wrong or do they have well, they, to get their own? They have their own, but um, typically you want to list them as an additional interest on your policy too. So oh. there's no gap. Yeah, because that's actually the bigger concern for most of us is property managers represent us and whatever they say, they're saying on our behalf. So if they discriminate, we're responsible. If they, right. whatever, you know, that's the biggest right. thing, discrimination yeah. lawsuits right now. But so, okay, so... So that's a good point to make sure your management company is also mentioned in the insurance policy coverage. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And nobody would think to do that. I don't think. 
Right. So, um, actually, it, um, I know you do. <laughs> it's in your, well, it's in your it's in your contract with them, and management companies will usually um, they, you, they, they yeah they usually follow up with that. Uh, yeah. They want they want to be named on your policy. Yeah. You know, that's true for our yeah. our Indiana new management company. I do remember yeah. seeing that in the policy and I yeah. thought that's weird. That yeah, but is- not all of them follow up on it. That's the, the strange thing. That not all of the contracts, management company contracts have that in there. Mm-hmm. The newer contracts, they do because yeah. there's there's big legalities. Yeah, now there. it's a thing, right? Yeah, you want to make sure both sides yeah. both sides have it. Both sides uh, you know, have adequate coverage you know the so management company was, oh sorry go ahead the management company in case there's any wrongdoing on their part mm. um to defend their actions and you know and for for you as well mm-hmm. and we don't need to be on their insurance then right no you're right no. okay no yeah that was it that's interesting i forgot what i was what i was going to say now Oh, so as a lender, I've had it, this happen a couple of times where people made a claim to their homeowner's insurance. And we, because we're also a named insured, they yep. had to come get us to endorse their check that they That's got. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. That's so becoming I'm saying more and more common. Because I'm wondering, is this going to happen now? Let's say one of our, inve- uh, one of our clients listening, they, they put a claim is now their management company's name going to be on that check and they've got to chase down the management company or does the insurance company realize this has nothing to do with management? I haven't seen that instance. I've only seen the checks come in payable to the insured and the mortgage company. Okay. I haven't I seen a, if a you third put party. them as a named insured, you know, um, I can't imagine you know that could be that. awkward. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm not, I, ha- I haven't, I haven't seen the, any checks with a management company and I'm trying to remember, trying to remember any instance because the management company has an, I'm just kind of thinking out loud yeah. here, but the management company has an interest in the property. Mortgage company has obviously a financial interest in it. Usually when you add uh, the property management company, um, uh-huh. it's just notice. Well, it, it is, right? it is uh, sometimes it depends on the carrier, but on some of them, they'll actually, they'll ask you um, of what part of the policy do you want them to be an interest of? And you can choose liability. Um, you can choose liability only. That's true. Okay, right. so, so we would just have to make sure that that's happening. Yeah, because so, I could see something happening where you have one management company when you start, and then you forget to switch it to your new management company. Then there's a claim, and now you're like having to go back to <laughs> yeah. the idiots that you left. You know? right. Well, you know, there's something to be said about that because that happened. That case scenario happens a lot with mortgage companies. Oh yeah. Where or you got the wrong mortgage company on well, the thing? What'll happen is, and we're we're doing many of them now. Um, we'll get a request to provide evidence of insurance because someone's refinancing their home, mm-hmm. and we'll go ahead and change out the mortgage company, and we'll submit them with proof of insurance, evidence of insurance that there's mm-hmm. coverage, and then something happens, and all of a sudden, midstream, there's been a lender change. We never get notified or the insurance company never gets notified. And then there's a claim or the loan falls through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the wrong company. Owned. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, lenders though are getting really good at following up. There's actually a third party company now that's managing oh. that whole mix to make oh, sure that they have current policies on file. So it's uh, they're they're doing yeah. a much better job where that is concerned, but but can be very frustrating. You yeah, know, that one basic. time I, that we had to endorse the check, it was like three years after we did the loan, and by then oh. we sold the loan. So it really we weren't shouldn't have been, even have been the endorsed the lender. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but, you know, but they hadn't changed the insurance to reflect the new lender that we sold to, and who knows if it was even that lender anymore. But my client from three years ago came back and said, "Hey, you know, our check for our boo boo mistake here at the house, we got to get you to endorse." I'm like, "Okay, yeah, yeah." yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, it happens. It does. Yeah. Okay, good. So let me just check to see if anyone has questions while we're, so if anyone has questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat box. Um, Cause we're kind of coming to the end of our uh, chat here. Um, what else did I have on here? Uh, okay. I asked about getting extra co coverage. So you did say that even if the master insurance policy has walls in or betterments and improvements, it's a good idea for people to, you said you would check that policy or they should check the policy and get advice and then upgrade with their own or, or make sure their coverage is complete with HO6 or is it just a good idea to always have HO6 regardless of the master insurance? I think it's, it's a good Absolutely. idea to have it anyway because let's say that you, the, the master has the walls in, you have all your personal property that you want covered. You can't get that from them. You're also okay. going to get personal liability, personal injury, so, yeah. And all of that is not covered by master it insurance, is not. right? No. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then you were saying, anyway, the deductible is really high, I guess, because it's such a big policy, it kind of makes sense. Typically, or, yeah. Or so obviously, you make, the deterrent. Yeah, you want to make sure you have loss assessment coverage, you know, in case you're assessed, right? Mm -hmm. That's on an HO6, so for sure you need it. Yeah, I think that's important for the realtors who are listening to to really advise their clients to get good insurance advice because – that the, the assessments can be huge and a lot of condos, huge. especially, I don't know, cause you guys are in Arizona. I don't know if, you know, really the, um, in the South Bay, the condos, there was a big push for condo building, like in the seventies and eighties. Right. So they're not, they're getting to be old buildings. They're 50 year old, 40 they year old are. buildings. Yeah. Right. And I know yeah. in Florida, they're super careful about that. They have 40 year, research and all this crazies. That's why I wouldn't buy yeah. a condo in, in Florida at all. But, um, but here we don't have those kinds of um, uh, things in place to assure that the building's in good condition and all that. So, yeah. Um, so these things are going to need renewing and remodeling and yeah, you know, nothing uh, else far, wiring and, you know, yeah. uh, for sure it's, it's coming. Yeah. So, you know, um, you guys have say. newer properties out there, right? Your condos are newer, so. Well, we do, but, you know, as you know, 99% of our business is still uh, in California. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? That's Go a lot. Keep talking, and it'll come to me. So one of my questions, uh, so do condo owners need to have earthquake insurance Oh, yes. That's a good, that's a very good question. Well, I'll just throw both in. I, I wrote earthquake yeah. slash flood in my thing. Just like the yes. extras that we think are extras. Yeah. Do condo owners need, or can they even get earthquake and flood? It, it is, it is entirely up to them. The earthquake insurance going back to the, the HOA master policy, that would be a separate add-on. Sometimes in for a building to do it's or? very expensive. Yeah, it's very, very expensive. I don't see it too much where the association, I mean, the HOA has master insurance that we, has the, the big ones. We have the uh, really big ones too. We got an email from uh, one of our clients that lives in a place in uh, Santa Monica and they just got um, earthquake coverage and flood coverage. Yeah, they went all out. Yeah. For the entire building or your, your clients the did it? The entire building. The entire building. Yeah. Yeah. It's over there where they have the uh, the waterways. Yeah. That place. Oh, in there. Venice? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's a huge complex over there. And it was just like, wow, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, big money. And they were asking everybody to check their policies that they had to make sure that they actually... I've never seen an association go all out like they've done. Yeah. They've done everything they right. They're sending out notices to all of their um, unit owners to check your policy, understand what your policy covers, what it doesn't, and how ours is. Get familiar with ours, yeah. and here's where to look to get our information. And I mean, just wow. very thorough. It was yeah. amazing. But to, to afford earthquake and flood? That was yeah. huge. Well, and then you got to think, okay, typically um, you either have a 10% or a 15% deductible, right? Well, they have, uh, what was the deductible? Um, 
was it 25% or? I think it was, was $500,000 deductible. Yeah, it was. It was on the um, earthquake because it was five, five million in coverage. I think that's well, it's about, crazy. Yeah. It's just crazy. Yeah. Well, but it's costly to rebuild a building, right? And if there's. It is. And it, it, it's the, an indication. Yeah. It's an indication they really want to do it all right. But wow, they've just yeah. really covered and their, their coverage on their units is all in. It's they pay for everything. Yeah. Wow. So that's, that's huge money, but those places are also worth a lot to each right. individual one. So yeah, in that case, they were recommending that the unit owner get their own uh, earthquake insurance right. with loss assessment coverage to help pay that deductible right. Right. on the HOA. Yeah. So, okay. So there was uh, no assessment yet, so they could still do that, right? Because you probably can't get insurance if you know that there's something... That's correct. Eminent, yeah. right? You can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's a special assessment right. coming next <laughs> month, so I better right. get insurance. Right. That would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't afford it. Here, Mr. Insurance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, the time I did to do remember. it is when there's, no, the, when there's no, nothing in the horizon that says something's going to happen, you, you get your insurance in place, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So if you right. buy, I think this is to Sean's point. If you see that there, or maybe Debbie, you said it, if you see that a building's old, but you still want to buy in this building, you want to buy a condo, whether as an investor or not, you probably should look at how old it looks. And then, oh, you were saying about the inside of the condo, but this applies to, to the HOA, right? It does. You're walking it, through a complex and you see it looks pretty old. Right. Get insured yeah. up, Right. Yeah, you've got to be really careful with that because, well, in the insurance world, first of all, when the condo itself is old and there hasn't been a whole lot of updates to the wiring, you know, the electrical, the plumbing, all of the, you know, HVAC and all of that, um, it limits the market potential where we go to get insurance. Oh, um, so and it costs more, and and it yeah, and it costs more, so. You know, it's a fine line there because, you know, you always want to buy, obviously, a building that's well-maintained, but to get the best deal, if the building is in a declining state, Mm -hmm. you could probably get a really good deal on it, but you're going to have a little problem getting the insurance. Mm -hmm. And do you guys ever have to ask for financials um, on the con? Like, do you, like, from a lending point of view, we want to know, are, how many people are de- delinquent on association dues? Does any one person it's own It's more about vacancy rate. Vacancy, yeah. okay, vacancy. Well, it's, so it's do you guys that. get anything, information straight from the association when you're doing insurance? N- no, I mean. If, if, or you're talking about us writing the HOA master policy? Uh, well, maybe, yeah, that would be a good question. But I mean, uh, just as an, because because of that loss assessment thing, I'm wondering, does the insurance company ask for any kind of financial data no. on the association no. to see if it's close to problematic or not? You know, no, they don't. N- not for, not in the initial um, insurance companies have become over the years um, quite informed they have lots of tools now where they can a lot of times find a lot of that information if they're given a reason to have to look. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that brings a good question again for my realtors. We've got a couple of realtors here on. So if you're putting a property up with the listing description and it says special assessment coming, does that affect the person getting insurance? It should. Like, is there any, yeah. Like the words they use in the thing is public, you know, it's in a public form, right? Zillow or whatever. Um, So there's things they can put in there that maybe they shouldn't be disclosing. uh, Yeah. See, like using into a sticky area. area. But but they should disclose You know, sometimes they use scary words. They have, well, and they, they're under obligation. Candy man special, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, everything has to be disclosed, right? Right. So, it's supposed to be. I, I, I guess I mean, better than, than 
not. I mean, obviously. Yeah. But I mean, in a, in a situation where, where somebody comes to us wanting a condo policy, we're going to offer them assessment coverage, whether there's yeah. one pending in the process or, or not, we're still right. going to offer it. Part of, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. What I, what I was thinking of earlier was um, you can get a really, really inexpensive uh, policy uh, like a bare bones where it's just going to satisfy the lender. Um, you can do that. Um, and, you know, maybe it's two or $300 for the year, but to get a real policy that is really going to protect you, it could be, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars depending on, you know, what it is that you have on the inside and how mm-hmm. large it is. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of where I wanted to go with that on the cost of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause you know, in the old days, I mean, you really could buy a condo policy for like $200 a year and it was comprehensive. Uh, it's not that case anymore. So yeah, to get a real policy with checking all the boxes, make sure you got everything. It's, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. That, and that makes sense. Like why go, you know, that's, that's a 30 or $40 a month difference. And if you're, yeah, you know, if that's making or breaking it, then it's not the right investment either, whether you're moving in or not, it's, it's, you know, $30 should not be because the HOA dues go up over time. So if $30 yes. now is too much, yeah. it's going to be too much soon. Right. So, right. Yeah. you know, so chintzing on your coverage makes no sense. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't see any questions for now. Um, and we're just about at the end of our time. So do you have any like parting thoughts or, you know, any kind of <laughs> words of wisdom for our condo buyers out there? Um, just that, uh, you know, know what the HOA policy has in it, what all they do ensure, how much of it, if there was a fire, are they going to, they're going to build outside walls, but will they also build inside walls of your unit? You know, that's. Yeah. I had a friend find the answer to that the hard way, not the easy way. Yeah. Yeah. It was sad and it was a six month mess. So you definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Well, so if someone wanted to run anything by you, their condo insurance or, uh, or even do a comprehensive like review of their insurances. Because sure. uh, I, I find when we piecemeal together stuff, right, you got insurance when you were younger from, you know, a big farm company, and then there's another farm company, you know, so you got all these different companies that gave you insurance. It probably would make sense at some point to look at it Absolutely. all as a, as a, as a whole, right? Yeah, it's good to review your insurance ever so often. Um, you know, it's um, things change. Uh, you might have done something, some addition to your home. You didn't think you had to maybe notify anybody, even remodeling that condo unit, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, anybody, anytime can reach out to us if they want us to review their insurance. Okay. Um, and how would they do that? They can reach us uh, by telephone, our phone number. We still have the, even though we're physically in Arizona, we still have the uh 310 area code phone number that we will have forever because most of our clients memorized it. It's yes. 310 uh, 214 2444. And they can also email us at uh, service at Zinker Insurance. And that's Z like zebra, E N K E R insurance, all spelled out dot com. Uh, yeah, we're always around either phone call or email. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for joining us and Thanks for your wisdom again. It's so awesome to hear your thoughts on these things because we don't even know what we don't know, you know. Yes. <laughs> so. Well, glad you invited us back. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Thank Bye, you. Guys. You too. Thanks, Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of My Cashflow Academy's Investor's Corner with your host, Athena Paquette Cornier. We wish you all the success you deserve as you use what you've learned here out in the real world. Check out the blog post for this episode, along with many more helpful resources at mycashflowacademy.com.